Uh, before starting, I would like to fix some, uh, some notations that I will be using quite a lot. So a path x is uh, just a continuous function. A continuous function from the interval 0, 1 to Rd. Uh, it could be from any interval, but just let's keep it simple. Uh, I will use the notation x of t for x of t. So it's quite common in probabilities. And uh, x st will denote the increment xt minus xs for um, s smaller than t. And although everything we will do is uh, will hold for any dimension, to keep the uh, notation simple, I will always use a notation uh, for d equal one. So um, we will uh, write everything as. Uh, if d is equal to one. So the second uh, definition should be quite familiar. So I will say that x is uh, C alpha for uh, alpha in one third one. If the following quantity is uh, finite, since so the usual Hölder uh, seminorm says so the supremum of the uh, increment of the paths over t minus s to the alpha. And uh, basically, I take t and s uh, uh, in 0, 1, and of course, different. And finally, I will say, yes? Sorry? XST, yeah, oh, you can put a comma, I don't know if that's a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the one third, of course, you can define this for uh, alpha smaller than one third, but it will, that's the setting yeah, we will be working with. And finally, um, I will say that X is in C alpha minus if X is uh, in C beta for all beta smaller than alpha. And the very last thing is a Brownian motion. Is a random T one half minus pass. That's all we need to know uh, about Brownian motion. Okay, so today I want to talk about two problems that are, are um, related, actually. So problem one is the following. I want to define the integral of x, the ys, against the x for uh, x and y in C alpha and alpha between one third and one. Second problem is the following. I want to uh, give sense of the following differential equation, dyt equal f of yt dxt with some initial condition. For x in uh, 
C alpha. But I want to do it in a nice way. So that would mean at least existence and uniqueness, but also a continuity of the solution map in such a way that the map that takes the initial condition and uh, the path x and gives you a solution is continuous. So that would allow you to, to use approximations, to treat approximated problems and say that the, the solutions are similar. So what we will do now, I, I will spend some time to tell you uh, why this is not trivial and why the usual tools um, don't work. And then I will give you, a, as I say in the title, a glimpse at what can be done. And I will talk about a specific theory, which is the theory of control rough paths. So this was uh, introduced by uh, Massimiliano Gubinelli back in 2004. And it has become quite relevant uh, these times. It has been one of the fundamental tools used by Martin Heyer to build a theory of existence and uniqueness of some uh, problematic stochastic PDs. Well, uh, in some topology. So in particular, we will see that the uniform topology does not work with a concrete example. So an observation first is that these two problems are quite uh, equivalent. So P1 can be written in the language of uh, P2 as uh, solving the differential equation, dZt equal y of t dxt with initial condition z of 0 equals 0. So that would be a particular case. And uh, P2 is well, not exactly equivalent to P1, but can be written in, in the language of P1 as y of t equal the initial condition plus the integral of the right-hand side. Okay. In order to solve P2, in particular, we have to give meaning of uh, the integral of the right-hand side, which is of the same kind of uh, the one uh, above. Okay, so let's uh, point out what are some of the problems we would encounter to, to answer these questions. The first one is that riemann stilges integration does not work. So I remind you what uh, the riemann stilges integral is. Um, you define this to be um, some kind of Riemann sum. I hope the notation is clear. So here I have a partition of the interval 0, 1. Uh, UV would be ex um, the extreme points of uh, each uh, interval of the partition and just build this uh, Riemann sums where U uh, belongs to UV, so the arbitrary point. And we, 
a classical result says that if uh, G is of bounded variation, then this converts for any uh, continuous F and any choice of uh, U bar in the, in the intervals of the partition. Verges. Or all F continuous yeah. if uh, G is uh, of bounded variation. Now, if the function is uh, C alpha and only C alpha, it is not of bounded variation. So, say if it's uh, C one half, then the size of these increments would be one over square root of n, say, if you take the regular partition. Then, if you are summing um, n terms of size 1 over square root of n, it will blow up, unless you have some miraculous uh, cancellation. So it seems that the riemann stilts integration is uh, doomed to fail if you want to apply it to solve these problems. But you can think, well, it's just that maybe we are clumsy and we are not able to prove such a result for a wider family of functions. And actually, there is a theorem that says that there is, you cannot do better. Theorem is the following. So, uh, let's, so let's define um, an operator on continuous functions uh, as follows. where I take the partition to be the regular partition. So TK is uh, K over N. Then if SN of F converges for all continuous F, then G has bounded variation. So it's not that you can define a riemann stilts integral for a function of bounded variation. That's the best you can do. And the proof of this result is quite simple. It just uses a, a bit of um, functional analysis. And it's very short. So the first thing you have to, to notice is that SN is, uh, in fact, a linear operator from um, the space of continuous functions to the real numbers. So we can use all the tools of functional analysis to deal with this. So I, I will do the following thing that will look mysterious. Um, at the beginning is that I will define a function fn, a continuous function with infinity norm equal to one, and such that Yes, yes, yes. You, th there is nothing. Uh, so I will define a certain test function. So I will, I will prescribe its value at the value at the, at the left points, uh, at the left points of the partition. So this will be take the value uh, ma minus one or plus one according to the sign of the increment of. Uh, of G so it will be the sign of uh, G TK plus one minus G TK. So SN of FN is equal to the followings. 
So if this increment is positive, I'm multiplying it by plus one. If it's negative, I'm multiplying it by minus one. So in any case, I get the absolute value of the increment. And this is related to two things. So first, this is related to the total variation of G. When I take the mesh of the partition to go to zero, this will converge to the total variation. And on the other side, I'm testing Sn against a function which has um, norm one. So it's also related to the, um, to the norm of Sn as an operator. Okay, this is smaller or equal to the norm of Sn as a, an operator. Okay, so this means that uh, these quantities will be smaller than the supremum of all these norms. Okay, now I can also take the limit in here when n goes to infinity, and I will get uh, the total variation of uh, g. Now, if I can show that this is bounded, I will get that the total variation is bounded. And that's where I use the, I will assume that this thing converges. So um, if uh, Sn of f converges for all f in C01, then This sequence is bounded in R for all F. It means that the family of operators Sn is pointwise bounded, and I can use the banach steinhaus theorem, which says that then it's bounded in norm. And this gave us uh, an, an upper bound on the, the total variation of G. Okay. So there is no hope to use Riemann Stills integration to go beyond the total uh, the bounded variation case. So we still learn something from this proof, beside the fact that this will be useless, is that so in the core of the proof is the fact that I can engineer a bad function, a bad test function, okay? So maybe I'm being too ambitious and I want to build the integral against anything, and anything means that I can build these pathological uh, test functions. But maybe I don't want to integrate uh, um, against anything. And that's in fact true. So we don't want to integrate anything against anything. For instance, let's go to problem one. In problem one, remember that we had dyt equal f of yt dxt. So it means that on small scales, 
I should have that the increment of y is the f of y s times the increment of x. So if I want to solve problem, this is problem two, sorry. If I want to solve problem two, basically I'm interested to integrate y, to, to integrate only functions that locally look like x, oscillate like x. So I'm not integrating anything again, x, only things that are quite related. So the second observation is that there is one classical theory that goes beyond uh, the bounded variation case. So, and that's the Young integral. is well defined for uh, f in c alpha and g in c beta as long as um, a plus beta is bigger than one. So that's good, but that's not good enough. For instance, it doesn't cover the Brownian motion case. So it does not cover let's say the integral of B against itself. Why? Remember that B was a C one half of one half minus. So when I add up the regularities of B and the integrator, I get something which is slightly below one. Okay, so we are below this threshold. So let me take a second to, to, to show you that some very uh, exotic thing happen when you go actually to, to bad exponents. So let's, um, let's talk about some uh, pathologies of Brownian motion. And there is a very funny fact that you can um, Say you want to build a Riemann sums for run and motion and, and try to decide if, uh, if they convert to something. Say take B of uh, T, something I will call TK epsilon times the increment. where tk epsilon is uh, something that interpolates between tk minus one and tk. Well, if this was a Riemann stage integral, this would converge no matter what the epsilon is. But actually, in the case of Brennan motion, this converges to what you would expect, plus something that depends on epsilon. And there is more. So this is um, uh, B is the Brownian motion evaluated at time one. Here? It's a Brownian motion, it's the same B. The square. square. Yeah. So, so if it was a usual function, you would stop here. So, so let's see an heuristic why such thing happens. So let's 
be even more general. So let's try to see what would happen with the fundamental theorem of calculus. So say take a F smooth. And uh, let's look at f of b1 minus f of b0. So we do the usual thing. We uh, split this uh, big increment into smaller increments. And then we tailor expand. So we get f prime of uh, b b k minus one times the in increment, and I will continue up to order two. Now, if B was smooth, say differentiable with the bounded derivative, this increment would be of order one over n, which is the size of the increment, to the square. So this is one over n square. You are summing n of those terms. So this whole sum as order one over n, it vanishes. Then you can just stop there to obtain the usual fundamental theorem of calculus. Now, this guy is a C one half, a bit less. So this should be of size square root of the increment, one over square root of n. So to the square is one over n, which compensates exactly with this n. So I cannot throw this, uh, this sum away. Okay. So in the limit, what happens is the following. That um, f of b1 equal to f p zero plus the integral of the derivative. Whatever this means, plus a second order term. What you have to put here is actually the s. So this is uh, something called Ito's formula. Okay, so yeah, so things can get very exotic when uh, you try to integrate against things that are quite regular. So we talked about the difficulties we encounter when trying to define these integrals, but let's uh, talk a little bit about the, the problem of uh, the continuity of the, of the solution map. So about problem two. So let's look at the following uh, example. So let's say we want to solve this uh, differentiable, differential equation. So I have uh, two one-dimensional paths, so uh, uh, two one-two-dimensional paths. Uh, let's say, well, let's give it an initial condition. So this can be solved. Explicitly, you just uh, use an integrating factor. The solution is here.
and I will take a very specific sequence of paths. We'll see what happens. Okay. So this is what we will consider. Take So in particular, this path goes to zero uniformly. So let's have a look at what happens with the uh, uh, solutions. So the solution in this case looks uh, like this, y t of n, uh, just as writing this um, in this specific case. So it will be um, where uh, this y and t is uh, the integral So this is not something we can compute, but at least we can estimate it. Okay, so let's, uh, well, let's see what this looks like. So what the n is have the exponential of minus uh, xn1, which is these things there. And then I have the dx2, which is uh, n times sine of uh, cosine, sorry, n squared t dt. Okay, so I I do the uh, obvious change of variables, which would be uh, to take s equal n squared t. Uh, then s will go between 0 and n squared t. Have cosine of s here, cosine of s ds. And then I have an extra one over n square, which uh, here, that's one over n. So, so this is correct. Okay. Now let's integrate by parts. So say this is the derivative of something, uh, this is just uh, something, so we exchange the, uh, the rules. So let's not care about the boundary terms. I will get the integral between zero and n squared t of e minus one n to the sine of s. And uh, what will pop out actually is a sine square of s ds. and an extra one over n, which comes from this derivative. So let's evaluate this. So this will not matter, because here I have something that goes to zero, 
uniformly, exponential of this, just goes to one. Now I have something which is positive over an interval of uh, order n square. I'm just taking the average of that. So in the integral of sine square uh, usually is about one half the length of the interval. It's true if you do it between zero and two pi, the integral is pi. So this should converge to t over two. And that's actually true. Hence the solution that we call yn converges to t over two plus y zero. Again, these exponentials just uh, disappear. So the map that takes y0, x1, x2, and gives you y is not continuous. in the uniform topology. So if you want uh, a continuous, uh, continuous solution map, you have to do something else. And it's actually, it's not just that you have to change the topology on these two paths have to do something more. And the nice thing is that this example tells you exactly what you have to do. So we will approach it in a different way. Zero, or the initial condition, say y zero. Yeah, yeah because the, the Right. So let's do something else. So let's uh, rearrange things a bit. So let's uh, extract this guy. This is a one. And now, very naively, uh, we will ta tailor expand. I mean, I will tailor expand inside this, uh, inside this integral. So the first order term will just be uh, one. And uh, in the second order term, I will see this uh, increment. Etc. Now this will go to zero. This is just the increment of uh, x and two, and we know that it goes uniformly to zero. You can, having a look at the the higher or the terms, you will see that they converge to zero as well, but not this one. Okay. So let's have a look at that one. So you see, d 
this is an iterated integral. So this is minus integral between 0 and t, integral between 0 and s, dx n1, u, dx n2, um, s. And now it's something you can compute. You just write down explicitly these two things. And I have the, the answer uh, over here. So after doing uh, all the simplification, you will get that this is, uh, except for boundary terms, that will go to 0. This is what you get. And this again converts to t over 2. So all the problem was apparently in this uh, iterated integral. So some, let's um, summarize everything we have uh, learned from these examples. So the relevant thing is, so first, that uh, Riemann steel disintegration is not enough. Uniform topology is not suitable. So that's the pessimistic uh, side of uh, what we have done up to now. But there is some hope. This term seems to matter. So what this example says is that whatever topology I I'm trying to, 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 uh, to use to have continuity of this um, solution map. It has to include this iterated integral. And that's actually what the theory of rough paths uh, does. Uh, everything clear uh, up to this point? So I apologize in advance because uh, I won't be completely rigorous here. I will give mostly intuitions, and then I will write down theorems which will not be completely correct. So there will be some bounds that will, you know, there will be things missing, like initial condition and stuff like that. But at least the, the relevant part, in my opinion, will be there. So, so we will talk about uh, controlled rough paths. So that's not the genesis of rough paths, actually. It's quite older than that. It goes back to maybe the 80s or 90s. It's by, um, worked by uh, Terry Lyons, 80s, maybe. Uh, what happens is that at some point, Gouvenelli reformulated the theory in a different way. And uh, that reformulation was the one that, that has been used a lot in uh, stochastic uh, PDs. So I, I will actually base this lecture on uh, some lecture notes of uh, Heyer and Fritz lecture notes. So they present Gubinelli's uh, theory, but maybe in a more accessible way than the, usual, the, the original paper. 
And let's start with the definition. Parts. So let's take one alpha between one third and one. So a row of parts is a pair. such that so x is a c alpha this uh, strange x goes from the interval 0 1 square to r and is such that It it also has some kind of Hölder norm. So we have to be a little careful here because now this is a function of two variables. So these st are actually two different variables. It's not a, an increment. Okay, so say it's a pair of uh, uh, Hölder alpha function and some kind of Hölder two alpha function. Um, and then I have to impose something, something more. So they cannot be completely independent one from the other. So we have the following relation. So actually, this has a name. It's called a chance relation. It's the integrated integral, yeah. Yeah. So this uh, relation is not completely arbitrary, but it's exactly what would happen if uh, we take XST to be the iterated integral of x against uh, itself. Okay. Now, this uh, identity is tricky because if I'm taking a x to be a very irregular part. So far, I don't know how to define this. It doesn't matter. If I choose, the point is that if I choose uh, this uh, x uh, double bar satisfying this uh, algebraic condition and this analytic condition, then it gives a satisfactory notion of an iterated integral. We will have all the properties that I would expect from an iterated integral. And I will take that as a definition. So to work with this, I have, um, so the expert used the name postulate. I have to postulate the value of the iterated integral. And once I have that, I can continue with the theory. So of course, um, I still have to do something reasonable there, okay? Usually these objects, one has to construct them by hand. Let's say when you, deal with a probabilistic problem, what you do is that you use this theory which is completely deterministic, but the place where you have to do probabilities is to build this uh, additional object. Okay, so, so an observation is that, well, okay, so we denote the alpha, the space, of uh, such growth uh, paths uh, 
And we will use the shorthand notation exa with underline. So sometimes we will just say x belongs to d alpha. It's just uh, an abuse of notation. So we say that I have to provide the iterated integral. And that's, um, that's tricky because I lose uniqueness. So let's take a rough path. And a function f uh, smooth. Then I can build a different uh, and this will satisfy change relation. So given a path X, this is no uh, unique way to to construct this, uh, this double integral. Okay. okay, so let's, uh, let's uh, define some norms. Uh, just one, actually. Well, not really a norm, but uh, a semi-norm. The important thing is that it gives a notion of distance in the space of uh, rough paths. Okay, so back to problem one. So let's see how this could be of any use for uh, what we have in mind. So remember that y looked like uh, x on small scales. Therefore, um, s close to t. So for short, let's write yst more or less uh, y prime of s, xst. So let's uh, naively try to integrate this thing and see what we, uh, see if we can guess what could be done here to define an integral. So let's integrate this approximation uh, from S to T. So I will have here a SR, VXR. Now S is fixed, so this goes outside of the integral. And here I have um, X, SR, VXR. So now, um, so here I have an increment. Only R will see um, the integrator. The ys is a, is a constant. So I get integral of yr dxr minus ys increment of uh, x, more or less. And here what we see is uh, the iterated integral. So it's, it would seem that uh, a 
a correct notion of integral should satisfy the following. And you see, that's not Riemann integration or Riemann series integration. In Riemann integration, you would stop here. What do I mean by that is that when I build Riemann sums, I just look at sums of these objects and they converge to what I call the integral. But now there is something here that seems to matter. Okay. It's different. So it seems that when we take y of this form, there is a natural way to build this integral. And this leads to the concept of uh, controlled rough paths. Go there. So again, I take alpha between one third and one. Believe me, in a few minutes, we will see why we have to restrict to alpha bigger than one third. Oh okay, yeah, so let uh, x be a rough pass. So we say that the path y is uh, controlled. by x, if there exists a path y alpha, alpha, and uh, again, a function of two variables, I guess, say, from 0, 1, square, to r. which has this two alpha non finite, such that the increment of y is exactly y prime of s times the increment of x plus a reminder. And the point is that the reminder has this higher order than everything else. I don't, both face here? No, no, it's the increment. It's the increment, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the both, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the uh, iterated integral does not enter uh, explicitly here. Okay, so an example, this is not too crazy. Um, Yeah, so first, uh, let's see how we will um, quantify the norms of these things. So for, um, so we denote by uh, d alpha x, the space of uh, control of paths. And we will define a norm. So technically, a control rough path is not just a path. It's a, there is more information there to say the y prime. We define the norm to be the norm of y prime plus the norm of the remainder. Okay. And you, you have some choice here. I mean, the, the, there are three objects which are not x in this, uh, in this uh, equality. They are not independent. So you have to pick two of them to quantify uh, the size of the others. 
Okay, so an observation is that uh, So what happens with the alpha norm of y? So actually, that's something you can uh, uh, estimate quite easily using this uh, decomposition. So this will be small equal to the infinity norm of uh, y prime, alpha norm of x plus uh, the two alpha norm of this. You could put an alpha norm, but it doesn't matter. And uh, no, you could put these two things together to get the, uh, the norm in the sense of control rough paths. And then you could even uh, put more here to get the norm of uh, x as a, as a rough path. So we can bound this by the rough path norm of x times the control rough path norm of, uh, of y. Okay. So an example, this actually covers uh, this covers a case which motivated us to introduce the notion of control rough path. I have until four. To I said one hour and a half. It says, here it says until four. <laughs> Sorry? Oh, they asked me one hour, one hour and a half. And, uh, so. oh, sorry about that. Okay. So examples of control rough paths. So if uh, f is, uh, let's say, c2, then uh, f of x is uh, controlled by x. And uh, its derivative is uh, Just that. Okay. And you can even estimate the norm. So here you have something that depends on the function. It's a C2 norm, actually. And also you can um, look at the composition of a of a y controlled by x. And it will be also controlled by x. And the derivative now, or the, the prime of these paths will be this. So it's sort of a chain rule. Okay, so back to integrals. So let's repeat this uh, the heuristic uh, we did before, but now with uh, equalities instead. So let's un again integrate naively on both sides. Uh, remember that this was just uh, iterated integral. So now I have the following equality. So it means that, a priori, if I want to define this, I should build a Riemann sum 
that involve these three terms. That's not very satisfactory because a few minutes ago we said, well, these two terms should matter and not this one. And that's actually the case because you see this increment there is of order t minus s to the two alpha. The increment of x is of order t minus s to the power alpha. So this gives us code for t minus s power three alpha, but now we choose alpha bigger than one third. So this is little o of t minus s. So when I build Riemann sums with these guys, this will completely disappear. And that's the main theorem. So take, um, again, alpha between one third and one, x rho of parts, and y controlled by x. Then, I can define an integral via Riemann sums. But now instead of just putting the increments, they have to put uh, more information. Yeah. And the notation here is uh, incomplete because it involves this term here, which is not uh, uniquely defined. So this is really an integral against, against the rough net. It's well defined. So furthermore, we have some bounds. So when we started the heuristic, we said that um, this integral should be a good approximation of this increment plus you know, this second order increment. And it's actually the case. This is bounded by, um, so here's where it's not really exact. But the important thing is that here there is the T minus L minus s to the three alpha, which is related to the heuristic I gave there. And also uh, an interesting fact is that if I define a path zt to be this integral, Then z is again controlled by x, and the derivative is y. Is what we would expect. Okay, so of course one should turn, turn the uh, heuristic into a proof you would have to do several things. So first, that show that these Riemann sums that I wrote somewhere converge, uh, that the, what you get at the end is additive and uh, stuff like that. So it's quite a bit of work, but I think the heuristics gives you the, the general idea. So now we have all the tools we need to solve uh, problem two. And by that, we mean, I mean that uh, we have the correct spaces where we can uh, use 
fixed point arguments to get uh, unique solutions. Okay, so it was something like that. So what I will do here is uh, to define a certain map, M, from the space of, uh, rough of paths, of control paths, to itself. And now here I will not just take Y, but Y together with the Y prime, it's a control path, and I will map it to y0 plus the integral f of y s dx s. Now it's the rough integral. So to get the map from control rough paths to control rough paths, I also have to give a prime for this guy. And the theorem above tells us that the right notion of derivative if uh, whatever I have inside the integral. So this is indeed uh, a control rough path. So um, let's say, of course, there are some analytical uh, uh, bounds, but they are provided by, uh, by the theorem above. So if uh, y, y prime is a fixed point, what we would have is that y of t is equal to y0 plus this integral and uh, y prime exactly what we want. So what we have to do, everything we have, any, what we have to do is to set a, a fixed point argument. So there are two things we have to do, is to see that M maps balls into balls and uh, that M is a contraction. So we can, we can give a fast sketch of proof that uh, M uh, leaves some ball uh, invariant. And there is actually a very funny uh, idea in there. So, that's, um, so let's see. So let's be So I will define a ball which is suit suitable for this problem. So I will fix the initial condition. But see, if I fix the initial condition, I'm also fixing the initial condition for the derivative, which is f of y. So y prime of 0 should be f of y0. And I will impose that y, y prime is norm smaller or equal to 1. Then what I have to do is I have to take y, y prime in this ball and show that um, what I have here is also in that ball. So I have to control the norm of the first uh, entry and the second entry. So let's have a look at the second entry. Um, so 
So it's something I, I wrote as an example. This is uh, bounded by uh, f, a certain norm for f, so norm of y. Now you see what we have to control the norm of this thing and show that it's small enough. And here it seems hopeless because these are fixed quantities. There is no way we can make it them small. And there is where we have to use a certain trick. And it's the following. So let's try to, to estimate this norm. So let's estimate the uh, increments. So remember that this can be decomposed in this way. Now this is small or equal to say y prime l infinity. A certain uh, Hölder norm of x times t minus s to the same exponent plus uh, the two alpha norm of the remainder, t minus s to the two alpha. So what do I want to do? I want to show that this is small, at least the norm. So I will have to divide by t minus s to the alpha and show that that will remain small. So here I'm good, because when I divide by t minus s to the alpha, I keep something which will go to zero when t minus s goes to zero. But now here, the natural thing would be to put alpha and alpha. So when I divide by t minus s to the alpha, again, I will remain with something that cannot be small. And that's where you have to, to go a little above alpha for x. Now, if you do that, then when you divide by t minus s uh, to the alpha and you take the supremum, you get that um, the alpha norm of y is bounded by y infinity. Then you will have a factor b minus alpha there. And if you take t and s in an interval 0 t, this will be bounded by t minus alpha, and there. T to the alpha. Okay, I'm just bounding these increments by the total size of the, of the interval. Now this is part of uh, the, the norm of y, y prime, so it will not matter because it's smaller than one. This also can be uh, bounded above by this, the norm of y as a control path. This will be bounded by the norm of x. So overall, this is bounded by the norm of y, the norm of x, beta, t to the beta minus alpha. This is more than one because we fixed it that way. This is a, a data, this is, x is fixed. So this is of order e to beta minus alpha. So if you take t small enough, then this will be small. And uh, at least uh, for the second entry, you will be in, in this ball. And the first entry can be treated uh, similarly. It's a standard uh, fixed point argument. So with the same ideas, you can show that it's a, it's a contraction. It's a bit more involved. And also then from there, it's quite easy to show that it will be continuous in this, uh, in this rough path. But you really have to, to use this as a rough path, not just as one entry. Oh, yeah, that's all I wanted to tell you today. Thank you very much. <laughs>